You're listening to another episode of Open Source CXO, the podcast designed to share insights on how to excel in your business using technology, regardless of the industry. Host Robert Kehoe is a self-taught software developer who has grown to the role of CEO. Renowned for his collaborations with organizations such as Stanford University, Nelnet, and Louis Vuitton, he continually seeks new challenges to conquer in the world of tech. Accompanying him is Don Blackburn, a veteran COO with over 25 years of experience in cultivating diverse relationships and driving innovation in various technical projects. Each week, they'll be sitting down with some of the nation's foremost technology leaders to develop an open source playbook, drawing from their firsthand experiences in the field. Let's talk some tech. Welcome to another episode of Open Source CXO. Today, our guest is Matt Watson, who is founder of Fullscale here in Kansas City, as well as a number of other companies uh, over time, I guess. Welcome. Matt, yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. So to kick things off, do you want to kind of share a little bit about your background? And I'm just a guy looking for something to do. Um, you know, I've been a software developer for over the last 20 years, entrepreneur for the last 20 years, built, uh, started four different companies, sold a couple different companies. Um, but I'm more of a product guy than anything. I would say I'm, I'm not the world's best engineer, but might be one of the world's best product people. Um, but I love to build software, and I feel like the hardest part about building software isn't the engineering side. Like, writing code is the easier side of it. It's knowing what code to write that is super hard. And I think that's probably part of what we'll talk about today with working with uh, outside vendors to help sometimes bridge that gap and figure that out. Okay. Now, you started, if I'm not mistaken, Venn Solutions, right? That's correct. Yeah, the, that was your first venture in 2003, and then we exited that in 2011. Um, it's an automotive CRM company, it's still the number one CRM company in the automotive industry. And that was a product, right? Whereas now you're it was a SaaS are, company. Yeah, right. It's a SaaS so company. now you've kind of migrated over to services versus. Yeah, so I've I've worked I've I've started three different SaaS companies, and then I also started a professional services, you know, service based company, some just like similar to your guys's company. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a totally different kind of business, and uh, I'm a fan of service companies for sure. So for Vint Solutions, did you guys internal only, or did you guys do any sort of uh, vendor relationships or outsource or anything like that? You know, thinking back, I don't think we used really any outside developers. I think it was all done in-house, and um, honestly, there was probably three of us that built 80% of the software wow. over the first, like, five-year history of the company, and then... When we sold the company, we had like 40 developers, but the, the three of us built like the core of the whole thing, and none of us had college degrees. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that. Like, Why'd you guys keep it internal then? Um, obviously, you know, just your your history and whatnot, there's there's an argument for outsourcing uh, versus hiring internally. Obviously, you guys chose to do the whole internal route out of curiosity. Why why was that chosen for Vin Solutions? I, th- I think for us, it was, you know, we were a SaaS company. We were a tech company, right? So... Um, that was building our own software and all that kind of stuff. Um, where outsourcing is, you know, even more prevalent in less technical companies, right? Um, we we also didn't have the budget for anything. I mean, that's probably the the real answer. Um, over my other companies, there were there were times that we used uh, different contractors that had different expertise and different things. Um, I've, I've definitely done that, before, you know, at different times. So there's a there's actually an argument that a lot of companies make that outsourcing is more of the cost savings route. So you're sort of saying that you guys didn't do that because it's really not a cost savings sort of. It's not a, it's not an answer for cost savings. You guys chose to do internally because, well, first of all, you obviously had the work. So hiring internally, you know, you could hire somebody on a salary and kind of have them do that. So. What is what is your take on the argument for that that cost savings? And I think I'm jumping quite a quite ahead here in my my agenda, but I, it kind of just came up. So, is there so, is there an argument for cost savings? Uh, I, I think I know there can for, be. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think there can be. I mean, especially if you're if you're finding expertise in something, right? So, for example, at at my company Stackify, it's like we needed somebody that was an expert in Elasticsearch, and we could spend forever trying to figure it out, or we could just go hire the expert and they could get it done way faster, right? And so from that perspective, there was definitely cost savings because we could get it done faster and we didn't have to learn how to do the things. But I think from the- That's true. Yeah. The part, part of the struggle we would have had at Venn is we were on a very tight budget. And 
So could we have could we have not hired a couple developers and instead hired an outside firm with the same budget? Maybe, but we you know we were trying to build our own our internal team at that time. Yeah. Um, but that was I mean that was like 50, over fifteen years ago that it we were probably really has doing that. But probably has something to do also with speed, right? How quick do you want to get speed, to market? Speed for sure. And I think I think the the, the biggest cost savings is going to be in in larger companies that. They need to get these projects done, and quickly. And they need to get them done quickly. And, and you know, they're they're trying to find the hired gun to come in and get this thing yeah. done, right? Mm-hmm. And part of what I mentioned earlier when we started that I alluded to was they're also trying to people that that know how to get it done, right? It's it's one thing if you take this big company you're like, oh, I could go hire a software developer for a hundred grand a year or whatever, but nobody still knows what to tell them to do. We can't agree on what to do. They don't know how to architect it. They don't know how to do all that, mm-hmm. those pieces, where if you bring somebody in where that's their expertise, you can you know, you know can airdrop them in. They can survey everything for, okay, this is the direction we need to go. Let's go, right? Where a lot of these companies struggle with that. They just don't even know what to do. They yeah. can't get out of their own way, right? And right. think that's where a lot of the cost savings would come in because you, you're able to, to jump in and figure it out and just make it happen, where right. they just can't, they just paralyzed. So for the companies that don't really know, kind of like what you're saying, which I totally agree with, I actually post about that a lot on LinkedIn. Uh, but for the companies that don't know how to, you know, hiring a developer is just the, you know, it's that shouldn't even be the first step, but it is a step, the first step a lot of people take, and that's why I believe a lot of projects fail is because that oh I'm gonna hire a developer, the project's gonna go great. So is there any, for for the companies that don't know how to build software, don't know how to manage a developer. How would you suggest companies like that? It's kind of, kind of hard to hire somebody at that point. You don't really know who you're hiring. Um, so what sort of, uh, I guess, what sort of suggestions or, or you know, starting points should there be for a company that doesn't really have any idea how to get started in a lot of this? That, that's, that's a question that, that I've sort of wrestled around with in our company is, well, a lot of people, they, you know, they know that there's a problem, but they don't really know, they don't really know what the solution is. They don't know enough about it to come up with a solution. So the whole, you know, one of our clients, they chose not to hire internally. Can they afford to hire internally? Absolutely, they could. Uh, but they chose to kind of do a lot of the work they do, you know, with, with Active Logic, just because, you know, we, we bring, you know, not just the developers, but that project development experience, you yeah. know, the whole, the whole process. Um, and that's why I think we've been successful. But uh, in your experience, especially with, um, with Full Scale there, like, what do you think, how do you think a company that doesn't have any any staff for developers, how would they go about trying to learn how, like if they needed something, how would they do it? So I think it depends on the complexity of what they're looking to build, the risk that's involved, um, all those sort of things, right? If you're like, I just need to build this little app and if it all fails, then it doesn't really matter because it's just this little thing that we're building versus like we're betting the entire company on this thing mm-hmm. and it's got to be successful and we have to hit this time frame, right? Then that's where you're like, we need to bring in the experts. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it costs, it costs extra. We need to bring somebody in that we're, we know we're going to hit this, right? Especially if they internally don't have the expertise. Um, we're, you know, a lot of times on, on the full scale side, we don't like working with clients that don't at least have some, you know, somebody experienced with working with developers for on the product side, maybe they've been a project manager or something like that, because you got to have at least somebody that understands from a product perspective, like what are we trying to build that can help lead the direction of it. Um, even if they don't have the expertise on some of the other management tasks, architecture tasks, project management, some of the other, other work that needs to be done, if they at least have the product direction, right? And, you know, I imagine for your clients, that's always probably really important too, but part of the expertise you guys bring in potentially is helping them probably drive some of the product. product we, we're involved quite heavily in coming up with solutions and not just developing. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things I just said recently was that, you know, coding's great. But one thing that we really love doing is, yeah. is coming up with those solutions. It's and like that's, the full solution architect yeah. kind of. Yep. Like and, we, and that's the big value that, yeah. you, that you bring is that. Literally, we just had a conversation this morning with uh, one of our potential clients who uh, they, they kind of know where they want to go with their product, but they don't. They don't know what's possible. Right. They, they don't know, all right, well, can we do this or can we do that with this API? And they don't really know exactly right. what they're asking. But so, you know, we've done plenty of research and a lot of consul- 
consulting, right. you know, whatever that means. Uh, but so we came up with what we feel is a good viable solution and they're over the moon currently. So hopefully that goes well. But, but I think that that's, that's huge to be said, uh, especially, you know, if you don't have the expertise consulting with a company who does is, is going to be, you know, paramount. And, and somebody that can help walk you through that development process. Right. I mean, cause we run into quite a bit with clients that have nobody, like you said, they don't have an IT department. They don't have a project yeah. manager. Yeah. They don't have really a product owner on that side. They may have a product owner that's, you know, a user that's a head of a business unit. Right. But they don't know how to develop software. They don't know the ins and outs of scope creep and, you know, well, and they, and trying they can, to stay on task. And they can still potentially be successful if they hire three or four developers and a project manager and, and they can make it work and whatever. But it to, to the point earlier, if they have, like, something super strategic and it has to be done on a timeline – you don't necessarily want to take the risk with that, right? Correct. Where if they're like, I don't know, over time we're going to build this thing and whatever happens, we're just going to iterate through it, then, you know, eventually they will iterate through it and eventually they'll make it work, right? Yeah. But it may yeah. take a lot longer. Yeah. It may well, cost that, that eventually money. costs money. It's yeah, it may, yeah, it may cost them more money. Sure. It depends on what those resources cost, too. That is true. So um, that's why, yeah, exactly. So the difference, the biggest, one of the biggest differences between our companies is that when, you know, well, first of all, I think your developers, they, you guys, your, your devs work very closely with, they, they manage expectations and, and, and tasks and stuff or do you guys do you guys actually provide sort of that project management oversight along with the developers we, so, sometimes we we also provide a project manager or product manager you know even on a fractional basis but usually our developers are working directly for they're for, like a part of the, the company then whoever the company is gotcha. yeah they're basically like their employees yeah. almost so yeah they usually need to be more of a development have more of a development team and, and we're just part Process, of the team yeah, yeah. Yeah, we 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 don't we don't have near the success when somebody comes in and they have zero IT you know in house at all. There's a lot of like, other skill set skill sets with that. One of those is just communication. That's the one comment we got from uh, the person we spoke with this morning is that we've explained stuff in a way that they could understand because they're not technical. Yeah, one of them is a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, so well, and that and that's the big value that you guys provide is you can talk to somebody about what they want to build. And they can only, and potentially they only tell you 20, 30, 40% of it, but you guys are smart enough to realize all the other things that they're not mentioning, yeah. right? And that, and that's where a really good, like, consulting development uh, firm understands, like, how to build software. Just know, hey, you didn't ask for these things, but we know you're going to need these things. Because they, I think that's a lot of problem that people have with software development is they don't know what questions to ask. They don't know how to describe it. And sometimes all they can really describe are the symptoms. They're like, we have these problems, but we mm -hmm. don't really understand the solution, right? Where you guys have built a lot of software, so you understand like, okay, these are the symptoms and we know how to like solve all of these problems. They just can't, they can't see it, right? Right. But you have to have a lot of experience building software to see those symptoms and, and understand like what they're not even asking, but what they probably need. And that, and that's the value that you guys provide. Which it's taken time to get there. Right. I yeah. Mean, um, early on, you know, in, in our company's life, we didn't have the processes in place. We didn't have the leads in place that yeah. could do that. Now it's, uh, but you're right. Leads it's, meaning it's a, software leads. Yeah. The software leads. Yeah, yeah. That that those are the ones that are front line, right? That have yeah. to talk to the client on a daily basis and understand that okay, when he says that. Yeah. Well, and that we got to take this. And that's account. that's been my expertise in my career. Is I've always been like the CTO, lead developer, lead architect kind of person. Where I could look at something and just immediately in my mind, I'm like, hey, we need to do this, we need to do this, da, 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 da. like this is how you build it, boom, go. Yeah. Um, but it, it that's a special skill set, it's right? Unique. It's a very unique skill set, yeah. and you know that's why people potentially outsource this kind of work because they don't have that skill set in house, yeah. right? And that's that's the value that. Well, I don't want like this entire about. conversation to be about trying to convince people to outsource. So, like, as far as hiring staff internally, it sounds like that they would they would do. They, they would start to hire internal staff when, you know, it's it's something that obviously they have the need for. It's a full-time need, and it's something that's not so outside of the box. They could actually, they can, you know, if it's not specialized, like you were saying. So I, I guess when would a company, if a company overall has this sort of drive to, we've had plenty of clients come to us and say, hey, we're going to start with you guys, but just so you know, because they're open with it. We're going to, you know, down the track, we plan on hiring internal developers. That's totally cool. We totally sure. get that. We know our place. So what, at what point does a company sort of, or what first steps I should, I should ask, should they take into kind of getting into that? If, if there's a new company, they're starting to do well, they've got their software sort of, obviously it's all based on skill sets and you can hire devs and whatnot. But I guess 
How should they go about exploring that world of, of hiring internally then? Well, I think most companies are going to hire, may hire internally first, right? Especially if it's like a SaaS company or mm -hmm. uh, a true, more of a true software company. Um, they expect that they're going to have their own development team to, to, to support the system and do all the different things. The well, isn't that assuming if they're like they have a technical co-founder or something like that? What if like what if the company is is two non-technical people or, or or a non-technical person that's trying to start a SaaS product? Well, I mean that's the hard part. If if you're if it's an early stage company and and there's nobody technical on the team, yeah, it's super hard to hire a developer, yeah. interview them, all those things. Yeah, because who makes another you qualified to interview? You know. Yeah, and 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 a lot of times they end up hiring just any developer they can find and calling them the CTO, but they don't know anything about managing and development team right. or any of that different right. stuff. But I think another common thing that you see these days is, so you definitely see people hire dev agencies to start, right? Be it, you know, local, remote, where, where all, you know, we, we, wherever. We've built a few ourselves, hiring, yeah. You know, building, hiring some kind of dev agency to help. And then maybe eventually they, like you said, they take over the project and, and run with it later. I think something else you, we're starting to see more and more of are fractional CTOs. Right, they're like, yeah. I, we need a, a fractional CTO, and maybe the fraction, maybe they still have a dev agency, but the fractional CTO is on their side, helping right. make sure the dev agency is doing things the right way, right. Or the right costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's with that's a, a that's a too. good. I wouldn't say that's a bad first step. That's a no, good first we've step. Worked, we've worked with a couple. We've had a couple of clients that hired fractional CTOs, and that and ended, I think ended up being in our, our interface with the client. Yeah, you yeah, know? and. And then maybe actually help you, right? Because the client could be a well, they total, add, they can either advocate or they mess. can they protect the client as well. I think a good fractional CTO would be one that that truly advocated for the client and made sure they you know didn't have any conflict of interest on, on this side. If a fractional CTO, in my opinion, sort of has these you know uh, these development companies that they're kind of getting kickback from, there's sort of a conflict <laughs> sure. of interest there. Yeah, so sure. I do like the idea of having somebody that doesn't have those ties. Uh, we know a few that we've definitely worked with. It's been some have been interesting, others have been great. So uh, yeah, I think it's it's another option. And I've I've met a few fractional CTOs, you know, recently. I don't know if it's a new trend, but maybe yeah, it's been I've going seen, forever. I've seen but, more and more on LinkedIn as well. It's yeah. kind of odd. But basically, they're consultants of yeah, you know, whatever you want to call them. And some of them are not fractional CTOs from perspective. They've never been a CTO, but all of a sudden they think they're a fractional CTO. Sure. So yeah. I mean, we could do a whole episode about what is a CTO, but that's kind of a yeah. different topic. Yeah, oh, that's fair. Um, now, you did mention that, okay, so um, when you hire, okay, so for your team or for your company, full scale especially, um, you have a, a development team that's it's really part of, you know, the culture and the environment of the company that hired them. Yeah. How do you get, knowing that they're not, they're not local, right? They're not on site. So how do you guys go about trying to keep that, like, in the ecosystem of the company, trying to keep... Or it doesn't feel like it's a separate team, or it doesn't feel yeah. like you know. So I th I think traditionally when people hire some some form of dev team in India or wherever it is, one of the big challenges that you have is you're a lot of times you're working with some kind of technical project manager, and you don't interface with the development team behind the scenes, right? And so that's very frustrating for whoever the the, the business owner, or the project owner is that's dealing with all this, because th those developers don't feel like they're part of the company. And they don't feel like, you know, you, they're, they, they're just not part, they just don't feel like they're part of the company, right? It's to your point. Um, and so the, the, the way to fix that is you've got to get them working directly with all the other employees in the company, just like they're any other employee, right? You've got to get them embedded with the company. Um, you know, they're do you guys have any ways you do that? Or, I'm, I'm certain you probably use something like, you know, Slack or, or Microsoft yeah, I mean, all Teams of, or something. So all of our employees are assimilate uh, with our clients using their tools, just their, Slack, okay, their tools. Jira, all okay. the different things, like just like mm -hmm. they're any of their employees. And I mean, you can just like send them swag, whatever they work for yeah. you, like whatever. I mean, we, we've had employees that have worked for the same client for almost six years. Oh, that's oh, awesome. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like it's part, good of their, business model. part of their team. Yeah. <laughs> so the, that's where our model is different is yeah. we're, we're primarily looking for long-term yeah. relationships, not just doing project work. We don't really, we don't really do project work. Right. So, now, what about like? Uh, do you guys work with a lot of enterprise companies, like big? Some, certain? not a lot. Okay. Um, most of our companies tend to be smaller. Okay. Um, but we have some larger clients too. I know some of the some of the we, we've worked with a few, and uh, one of the biggest challenges that I think we've seen, just in big business in general, is just all the different red tape for one. But um, they don't they they have a lot they need to do, but they 
you know, and, and it's, it's something that they don't always hire internally for because they're not, they're not massive initiatives. So it always makes sense to like break off these little portions of, of a product and have, you know, an agency do them or maybe a contract developer uh, from a staffing agency do them. Um, it, I didn't know if you had any experience as far as, um, I don't want to use any, any names of companies, but cause I do have one. Please don't. <laughs> I, I do have one in mind, but they struggle with trying to, all right, you know, let's, let's break off this piece. So my question is sort of a, is a couple in one is like, is there any sort of like a, for the bigger companies, is there any sort of ideas around, okay, what, what constitutes, uh, even if they have a dev staff, what constitutes you breaking off a project and sending it to an agency? Is there a certain type of, of work that should only be done in house? Like, close to the company and another type of work that you know might be a good fit for an agency is there any any insights there that that can try to help these you know these companies I, really make their decision on we need to carve out this piece and throw it over here or i think the key is can you carve it off right i think that's one of the hardest challenges like so it, uh, back to like the vin solutions days we'd built a big crm and it's all very interconnected absolutely and so it'd be really hard to say hey go just work on this one part of it without you know, I mean, you're basically going to have to have access to, to all the different pieces probably, but it becomes harder to just carve off a piece and just go work on that piece. I think so. What would, it's what easier would, if it's like, oh, go work on this mobile app or go work right. on like a whole, oh, yeah. Some whole completely, different, you know, independent, absolutely. A, an independent piece. It's like, hey, you can work on the mobile app. We have all these APIs that you consume or whatever, but just go build the mobile app. And we actually did do that at Finn. Now I think about it, we had an outside contractor that built our mobile app. Okay. We, we, we had Did a, you eventually take that back in house? Um, I, eventually probably, but for a long time we had a, yeah, we had an outside mobile, mobile developer. Yes, we did. So I can imagine it'd be sort of a challenge for, especially for Vin Solutions. Like if you have this big intertwined, you know, monolithic sort of application, it was, you sure. have to ramp up on that. You'd really have to get developers do, do, would they have to, I just know that some of the software we write, there's, there's some software that you, you're going to have to learn quite a lot just to be efficient. You, you open the solution file and it's a hundred projects yeah. that are all. Yeah, Your then build you have time to takes understand. five minutes. Exactly. One of those things. So does luckily that... we don't have as many of those this morning anymore these days, but um, but that's hard, right? And it's like how do you carve this off? How do you how do you get a developer up to speed on a big complicated system right. like this? Is, I think that's a struggle a lot with a lot of companies, especially the bigger they are. We yeah. we've seen a few though, or larger companies will have old systems, legacy stuff, yeah, that are running in the background that's way outdated that want to totally update it. Those are great projects to yeah. kind of package them up, shoot them or, off. Or somebody's got an Excel spreadsheet they're trying to manage everything. It's like, <laughs> well, hey, you know. Make sure. it look like this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. that, the only guy I can make it look like that. Yeah. For sure. Please don't make it look like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but, it's hard, though. I think it is really hard to figure out how do you how do you carve off a piece. Yeah. I think it can be a challenge. I mean, how do you how do you guys deal with that with your clients? Where do you, where do you uh, see so that? So there, there is a fit for us to where we, we did have a pretty large client, um, that we worked with for, you know, still do, but um, pretty heavily for a couple of years. And uh, they had a portion of our staff kind of in a similar manner to what you guys do. It was, we, we just sort of were absorbed into their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, now the unique thing, you know, we do it a little different. I think that because we have, you know, we have the software leads who do a lot of the interfacing and yes, our developers, they do daily stand up. So, you know, our developers were part of the daily stand up yeah. and whatnot, but our team actually, even though we were, really a part of the, you know, this other culture um, our, our team still was very much a team uh, under under our umbrella um, just because the tasks you know were given and identified by some of our our software leads that were broken up and kind of managed by by our team so we became this sort of like ind independent sort of you know solution we were still a part of them but we were a little right still a little outside so we weren't you know we, we still maintained our brand and kind of our identity but um, so that specifically, they did not break off a piece. They they couldn't. It was okay. just, it was a very similar. Right. They had, yeah. They they had a plan of what they wanted to do in in a, in a large on a large scale, yeah. and then half some of the members of their team broke off pieces, passed them down to our team, and we were experienced. We've been working with this application for for a few years, so we we were definitely uh, we knew enough about it to where we can break off those, piece it out to developers. But everybody had to learn the entire yeah. build process, that, that whole deal. So, Well, you, when you talk about when to outsource stuff, so when Stackify first started, we I didn't know shit about Java. Like, I'm not a Java developer, right? But we needed Java developers. Couldn't find any Java developers. So 
um, where I worked with a, a dev agency that was here in Kansas City to hire a couple job developers. It wasn't us. What the heck, man? Well, <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But um, like that was a, the example of like we didn't have an expertise in this thing, and it was totally carved off. It was a totally different app. Yeah. Um, and same thing. Like I had at one point, I had another startup idea. And I found another dev agency, and I gave them 100% of the work. I'm like, you guys just go build this thing. It was kind of, yeah. it wasn't part of, it wasn't part of what Stackify was doing. It was a totally just different like business idea. Yeah, that would helped us. We we would have been the customer of the thing. Um, yeah. I just totally carved it off. Said, here, go figure out how to build this thing. Did it work? So it wasn't it wasn't business critical. Yeah, yeah, it worked. We okay. we eventually ended up never not doing anything with it, but oh. yeah. I hope that doesn't happen too often. <laughs> well, spend no. all this time expensive. and money. Yeah, yeah expensive. It's, it's too expensive in software to be doing that, man. Yep. No, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I had another question regarding that, but I lost it. It's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, they pretty much did it. I mean, we can edit some of this stuff out, don't you worry. Sure. All right. <laughs> but I think that uh, we covered most of... Uh, <coughs> Communication. I guess the only other, you know, topic sort of on my list here is just the, the communication of it all. The uh, it, Speaking specifically about data privacy and security and, and things like that, it's probably not something you guys have to deal with a lot considering that you're, you know, uh, at least in the sense of full stack, um, you guys, it's just they're part of the, the whole culture. So that's probably not as big a deal. But uh, as far as, you know, HIPAA compliance and even, you know, when you get into healthcare applications and different things like that, I don't know how much experience you have with, I'm sure you've gone through your, you know, your penetration testing and, and having to keep data secure. But is there any, you know, when, when working with a sort of an outsource vendor, um, one, of the, one of the main concerns is making sure the data is always secure, is always private, it's always, you know, you're not going to be held, it's not going to be stored. A lot, we, we've worked with some banks before. And there's a lot of rules and some standards. We've worked with some fintech companies. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something you guys run into often enough as far as data privacy and just trying to keep things secured from a just somebody, you know, I think Snapchat or I think it was Snapchat or some some app, um, you know, the data was accessible to, you know, their entire the entire staff. And a lot of that stuff ended up leaking. And is there any I obviously there's not a whole lot you can do unless you really lock things down. But from a from a purely just working with an outsource vendor perspective, is there anything that can be done or anything that you guys have done in the past that that you could you you know implore to kind of protect the data or, or keep it well, safe? Well, so our employees just follow their lead. So whoever the client is, I mean, we we just follow their lead. However, they do things, whatever their processes are, whatever tools they require, our employees just follow the standard, just like any other employee would follow. Um, you know, we do install some like endpoint protection kind of stuff on their on their you know PCs and stuff. But you know, really, it's just from a a lot of that comes down to um, the privileges they have, the processes, you know, d different things, different controls. But that really comes down to them following whatever the company's kind of protocols are for that kind of stuff, you know. But, I, but you know, the, the other part of the topic here is, is this is a problem that a lot of people have if they're just hiring, like, a random developer on Upwork or something like that. Like, you don't really know this person. You've got some random developer working wherever they are in the world, mm -hmm. and they can just disappear. Yeah, and you know not that you don't really know much about them, and mm -hmm. for some people that's okay. Yeah. But from like a business continuity perspective, a security perspective, compliance perspective, intellectual property, all these things, that's one of the advantages of working with a dev agency. Is you know you're working with a dev agency, you have a relationship with them, and you know they're supposed to hire employees that follow all these rules and do all these things, have background checks, all the different things. Right. Um, that's one of the problems with hiring random contractors is it's harder to. Yeah police and enforce these things where if they're hiring a, a, a true dev agency at least you have them to hold accountable of, of following these sort Absolutely. of protocols sure yeah well, that makes sense a lot but I, I mean imagine same thing with you guys it's like you know if you're working with somebody HIPAA you may have to just do things differently than a different client but also you know differently most of our devs don't have access to production yeah. level data anyway so you know it, it's minimized in that capacity and typically speaking there's only like one or two people in the entire company i don't even think i have most of the access myself so um <laughs> but we, yeah i imagine they want to keep you out yeah, yeah i'd imagine so <laughs> no but, but that's you so we we minimize it as well um but you know having having you know 
developers all around the world, you know, different laws and different places. And, and like you said, yeah. contractors and whatnot, it's just, it can be a, a bit of a challenge. So, you know, most applications, I, I would agree that, you know, there's not an absolute need to keep all data completely, you know, locked down, uh, you know, like makes certain, it really hard to do data. your job. Yeah. Certain As a developer, it makes it really hard to do your job if you don't have access to I agree. all the stuff. Even in a staging environment, when you have mock data, it's very frustrating. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to thank thank you, Matt, for for coming on and kind of talking to us about this. I hope that uh, a lot of you know the insights that you've provided will be helpful to some of our listeners. And uh, being that we're new, so uh, you know, I don't know how many listeners we have yet, but we'll get there. Uh, but no, I do appreciate it, man. Thank yeah. You. Thank you so much for having me.